Hi, folks. Steve Urban here, founder and CEO at RiderFlex. We hope you enjoy today's podcast. And as a reminder, please subscribe to the RiderFlex show for updates on new episodes. And by the way, if you haven't already, check out the book we recently launched, The RiderFlex Guide, Inspiring and Hiring, available for purchase on Amazon. And now, a quick word from our sponsor. Try the number one marketing platform for small business. Everything you need from design to marketing to CRM. Learn more at marketing360.com. Marketing 360. Fuel your brand. David Schillingford on the Rider Flex podcast. Hello, David. How are you, sir? I'm very well. Thanks for having me on. Should I call you captain? Do people still call you captain for, for fun? Your friends? Uh, they 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 don't. <laughs> no, nobody calls you captain. I don't know. I, I had a boss. We called him captain for a long time. I don't know. He wasn't even in the service. But congratulations on on your time and thank you for your service to your country and just being in the military. Congrats. Um, yeah, it was it was my honor. Thank you. Yeah, congrats. So before we get into you know business and. Talking about Everstream, I want to know a little bit about David. Give me the give me the early life stuff. Give me some mom, dad, where you grew up, siblings. Can you give us a little overview, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah, sure. I guess the, the short version is it stems from my father having been in, in the Royal Navy for most of his career. So I was born in Malta, little island in the middle of the Mediterranean, um, and... Cool. Spent much of my youth living in different parts of the world. Never lived anywhere longer than two years. Uh, as a result, went to boarding school in England, but also got to live in uh, countries like like Australia. So um, after that, university, studied chemistry. After that, uh, went into the British Army. And after that, 25 years ago, um, found myself um, unexpectedly leaving the army and in New York city. So it's, uh, I think the longest, the longest time I'd ever lived anywhere was after I'd spent three years in New York city. So uh, a little, little nomadic. I would say. Wow. Wow. Uh, you're, did you have that goal and desire to be in the service even when you were, when you were young because your dad was served? I, I don't know if it was quite as intentional as that. I think it was something that um, a lot of people around me, not just my dad, but other relatives and other people I knew that, that they did. And it wasn't as if it was accepted that I would, but it, it was it was somewhat normalized. Um, and I, I, I had no other real career aspirations. So uh, I, as I say, it was <laughs> like much of my career. It wasn't very intentional, but I'm, I'm very pleased that... Uh, I, I was down that path for a few years. How about your mom? Uh, I guess if you traveled around every two years, was she raising you and siblings, and or did she have a career as well? Uh, well, she had a career before we all came along in, in publishing, um, but I would say, particularly back then, being the wife of a naval officer and moving house every two years and making yeah. a new group of friends and everything that went with it. Um, even even though me and my elder sister were at boarding school, uh, she she was pretty busy with, with with all of that. I imagine. Was your dad a tough character? Was he pretty hard on you? Was he old school officer? You know, was it pretty strict around your house? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I, I wouldn't really sort of use the word tough necessarily, but um, certainly um, pretty, pretty pretty strict. Expectations were were, were pretty clear and. Uh, I, I was often outside them, uh, so <laughs> maybe, maybe the two go together. <laughs> well, can you share some? Give us a good one. What's give us give us a little something when you got in trouble one time? Give us. A, did you have to call your dad from the from the police station or anything? Anything fun? Anything you want to share? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's sort of it's one of those things that as you as you get older, um, you know, the, the 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 issues get a little bigger. Um, so. <laughs> And, and and I think back then there was you know now we know what our kids are up to probably more than we should. Back then right. I think uh, our parents were often unaware of what was going on. So um, pr probably a good thing for me and 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 for them. Um, but I, I I tripped up plenty of times in my youth. 
You know, I talk to my co-founder. I'm 56 years old this summer, and I talk to co my co-founder all the time. And I always tell him, I'm like, man, I am so glad we didn't have these smartphones when I was in high school and college. Oh, my God. I'd have been not good. It probably wouldn't have been good for me. <laughs> it's not. Uh, smartphones, uh, um, they're, they're a real real problem, real challenge. Uh, but, you know, for yeah. parents, but particularly for, for kids, it, it makes their life much, much harder. I agree. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, married kids, grandkids, what's the personal life story now, socially, I guess? Yeah, no, no grandkids as far as I'm aware. Um, <laughs> let, let's hope not, because uh, my youngest is still in high school, um, and okay. my other two boys are uh, uh, in, in and around sort of, you know, the, the, the college uh, side of things. Um, okay. my, my wife um has uh she's english she uh we met in new york actually we met at new york in new york at her leaving party um so uh she eventually i i, I persuaded her to move back um on, on the understanding that it was a temporary thing and, and here we are living in northwest connecticut 25 years later so um wow. my wow. my my um the way I make up for that is that I help her build this amazing three acre garden that looks like a slice of England in the Northwest corner of Connecticut. That's become her business. Very um, nice. Okay. And, All right. Now whereabouts, if you don't have to give me the the address, so to speak, but uh, I lived <laughs> in, uh, I lived in Avon Simsbury and then moved further West out to Torrington. So I'm, I'm a little yep. familiar. How much further West? Of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, keep, keep, keep going West. Um, and, okay. and if you get into Massachusetts or New York, you've gone too far, but, but only just we're right, right up in the corner there. It's a, it's a beautiful part of the world. Uh, yes. Great, great people. Uh, we, we love it here. Very, very lucky. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how that part of Connecticut, uh, it just moves at a slower pace, right? You go, you go south, right, close to the New York border. It's almost like a different country. It's like it's like a completely different state, isn't it? It, it really is. It really is. Yeah, you cross the border and uh, you, you you know you're in New York. You know you're in Massachusetts. Uh, for, you know, for good or for ill, it's uh, it, it definitely feels different. No doubt. Now the winters are. I, I, of course, I guess you're used to it, but. Uh, you got to like snow, but um, yes, the spring and summer and fall for you is absolutely beautiful. It, it, it is. And we all love to ski, so we get the best okay. of both worlds. Okay, very good. That's nice. Great, great, great. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Sure. So you get out of the service. Do you know what you want to do at that point? Are you like, okay, what, what the hell am I going to do now? Or what, what was the plan? <laughs> uh, I, I had no idea. Um, I, I didn't even know what normal people did as a, as a job. So I, I, I spent uh, all the time that I had uh, networking and talking to people and asking what they did and what they thought I should do. Um, and there's a lot of traditional paths out of the army into big companies like City and GE and uh, um, and, and, and others, um, and, and by kind of, a, I guess, as part of the networking, but as a series of coincidences, I, I met someone who was connected to the military who'd set up a, a, a small company to help recover stolen art. Um, okay. And I was, I was in part leaving the military because the next, you know, however many years put me behind a desk or would have put me behind a desk. Uh, so I, I didn't really want to go into a, a, a traditional career. Not that I really knew what that what that was. So this this sounded sounded fascinating, interesting. I and so I was on the next plane to New York uh, with with my worldly possessions in two bags uh, to to join this company that that sounded uh, interesting and fascinating. Was this before you were married? Then it was. Okay. Wow. You spent how many years in the service? Uh, eight years. Eight years. Okay. Okay. Well, you, all right. Very good. Okay. So you, you're going to New York art lost register, right? So they, there's companies that that's what they do for a living, discover or find stolen art. I, I had no idea that there's actually companies that just do that. They, that's all they do. Well, it, it, it's the only company that does that. Uh, there are, there are, there are plenty of people who help recover stolen art either because they're in the police force or because they work for an insurance company directly or indirectly. So okay. there's quite a lot of in, in investigators out there, but it's the only company that has kind of done this from a, a data standpoint. Wow. Uh, 10 years. Now you must have some interesting stories there, right? I mean, you, you got to, 
you got to uncover some criminals. You got to be involved in all kinds of cool stuff. Give me, give me something. Share, right, right. share, share a good one. Give, give us a good story there. I know we we won't stick long on that, but I, you spent ten years there. Give me a, give me a fascinating story, real quick, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Yeah, there are quite a few interesting stories. I bet. Um, well, what, what I mean, the, I'll give you the short version of this, but as you can appreciate, it's probably you know it it does it does require a couple of beers and uh, a lot longer than. <laughs> <laughs> this so we uh get a call from an insurance company they've been asked to insure a work of art to be transported uh from a to b um they're a little suspicious they call us they ask us to look into it uh we do and it it leads to a three-year investigation uh that involved police forces uh in the us in europe in russia um, and the the long story short is that the artworks had been stolen in Massachusetts 30 years prior. Uh, one of them was a Monet, um, and the lawyer of the person who stole the artworks um, had, was the person who had hidden them for 30 years. Wow. And was trying to find a way of... Uh, turning them into money. And he figured that going through the insurance industry would be the way to do that um, and had set up a Panamanian company. And uh, it was it was a pretty interesting investigation, as you can imagine. <laughs> interesting. So the person that had hid them for 30 years, I guess what happened? They got older and needed the money, so to speak. So now they're trying to turn it into cash. Is that was that was that the motive? Well, I, I, I don't think it was necessarily a, a, a trigger, a financial trigger. Tr trigger point. It was more, how long do I have to sit on these things before uh, no one's going to know where they came from and uh, not ask any questions and be, be happy to, to have them back? Oh, wow. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I bet that was a fascinating. Did you even care about art? Like, were you an art guy? Are, were you, could you go into museums and you can look at art and know what it is? Or, or were you like, yeah, I have no idea? Or, or, <laughs> just curious. I was, uh, no, I, I was not. Um, but I, but I figured I needed to become that person, yeah. you know, a, a couple of hours prior to my interview. And <laughs> what, I mean, one of, one of the things that I, I, I like to say to uh, younger people who these uh, days are being told, find your passion, find your purpose is, uh -huh. well, that's all very well and, and, and great. Good luck finding that. But what, why not become passionate about the thing that's in front of you that you need to do to pay the bills and, <laughs> The better you get at it, the more passionate you will become about it. And yeah. you could become a world expert in something that you never even cared about. And not that I ever became a world expert, but <laughs> if, if expertise is a relative thing, I guess I was an expert um, after having done it for a couple of years. And I, I would go to museums wherever I was, and I, I still do. And it, it has become a passion of mine. Um, it, it's, uh, who knew really good advice, David, great advice. That might be the highlight clip right there from your interview. I like that really good <laughs> for the listeners. How did you get from art to supply chain? Cause it kind of tied together with the transportation supply aspect of it, or how, is that how you kind of moved over into supply chain? Um, yeah, there were a couple of steps in, in, in the middle. Um, and as I said earlier, very, very little, if any of this was, was intentional, um, but the the business model around the the art business was in in part that the art world would be carrying out due diligence through the database that law enforcement would be using the database to support their investigations and help recover more art but it was primarily funded by the insurance industry who were very often the people who would benefit from a, a recovered painting that they had paid a claim on Excellent. and but it was, it was kind of a small niche business. And um, a lot of the insurance companies were complaining about other things. And quite often they'd say, well, you know, art, sure, but A is a much bigger problem or B is a much bigger problem. Um, and so that led to another business that did a similar thing, but for construction equipment, oh. which was and still is not titled or registered and, and with a variety of different identification numbers and, and the positions. So although it's uh, a lot more expensive than a, than a car, uh, 
law enforcement found it difficult to identify and recover stolen backhoes and skid steers and things like that. So we set up a business to do that. Uh, it, it eventually sort of became the, the DMV for off-highway equipment. Um, but again, was was kind of funded and sponsored by the insurance industry, but with equipment owners and large rental companies becoming second leg of the stool, the third being law enforcement. Um, and yeah. that was, you know, it was, it was, you know, reasonably successful business. We sold it to a very large uh, insurance data analytics company. And it was while I was at that company that I was encouraged and asked to think about other adjacent businesses and verticals. And, and that's what led us to supply chain by way of cargo theft. Interesting. <clears throat> you know, I never would have thought, how do, how do you steal a backhoe and hide that? I mean, how do you steal a bulldozer and not, not, I don't know. I don't, I don't right. understand. How, well, how does that happen? It's a, it's a, it, it's, it's, it's a great question. And I, I don't want to give too much away, but I'll just say it's very easy. And think, things really? have changed a bit in the last sort of 15, 20 years since we started it, because there's more, security built into the equipment there's right. the, the gps systems and things like that but it is still yeah. given that this equipment lasts for decades there's still an enormous amount of equipment out there that can be literally started with a screwdriver and i mean if you think about it if i own a a, a work site the most important thing for me is productivity the most important thing is that i can say Jill, Jane, Bill get on that backhoe and dig a hole rather than mm -hmm. spend the next hour looking for the key so, you know, pe people on a work site are going to have a ring of keys that start pretty much any machine in the uh, in the known universe. Added to that, I didn't know that. Didn't know that. Or no they have the key. Or registration. Oh, I lost your audio right there, David. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I lost your audio for a second. Or they have the key like in a box or like hanging on the side or something, right? Yeah, sure, sure. And you can sell it without any questions because there's no title or registration. So, and and it it, it hides in plain sight because. Uh, one John Deere backhoe looks like another John Deere backhoe. So it's uh, <laughs> it, it, it's actually, you know, I, stealing art, stealing art that's worth, you know, a million dollars, that's pretty hard to sell. But you steal a, a backhoe worth $50,000, it's uh, it, it's um, it's easier to sell. <laughs> Interest, that is fast. We could do a whole podcast on that topic. Uh, one, one last question there, because I don't want to keep you on that too long. These days, like a brand new one, right? Surely there's like little GPS chips like hidden in the in the engine or something, right? Probably. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah. They 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 have they have GPS on them. I mean, again, a lot of that's to do with productivity, but can also be used for recovery. They're generally mm -hmm. not designed primarily for, for security, but you can you can add on devices that are a, a bit more covert, a little harder to, mm -hmm. to disable, and uh, certainly the ignition systems are are more more secure these days. So yes, but yes. but the bad guys, of course, the, the the real bad guys, the professional bad guys, they already have the equipment to find the GPS chip and take it out. <laughs> the, uh, the 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 bad guys, the good ones, the ones that haven't been caught yet. In other words, uh, yeah. yeah, they they invest a, a more time and money um, and effort and thought into stealing these than people generally do to protecting them. It's. Uh, <laughs> You know, you know, you focus on your main mission, don't you? That is fascinating. Okay. Wow. You had a pretty, that, that is an interesting career. I mean, you got to meet all kinds of characters. You could probably, yeah, I've got to have beers with you. You could just sit around and tell stories for hours. I bet hours. <laughs> uh, you never came across a situation where something out of a movie, right? Where like a bad guy like calls you and says, Hey David, back off or whatever. Like I know a family or you never had any of that, anything crazy. Did you? Uh, but the, I, no, I never felt as if uh, there was okay. uh, a threat okay. against me or my family. Um, okay. Generally, you know, we were the sort of the information business behind others okay. that were very much more on kind of the sharp end, particularly, you know, law enforcement. But you, you do get to see a lot of what they do. And, uh, you know, you, you grow a lot in respect for the, the very difficult job they have to do. No doubt. Yeah, because you, you're talking about millions of dollars. There's some there's some bad people out there. Wow. Fascinating. Okay. That's good. I, I didn't know that we were going to get a chance to talk about that. I, I would have booked you for longer. <laughs> That's good stuff, man. Okay. Now when you did that, that company, now were you, was that, I guess, uh, officially your first 
chance at entrepreneur and did you own part of the company or were you just an officer in the company or how did that work? Yeah. So I, I was the, the, the founder and CEO of that company. Uh, okay. We obviously had, had investors um, behind it who um, had, you know, a, a pretty significant ownership. Um, it, I mean, to me, it was primarily a way of uh, a paying the bills and b learning about business. Um, having okay. spent eight years in the army and, figured I needed to do something to catch up to the rest of the world. Was that cargo net? What was the name of that? So that was called the national equipment register. Um, and it was when I had arrived at Verisk analytics and we were looking to be a little more entrepreneurial inside this $20 billion company that we okay. started uh, a company called cargo net. I see. Okay. Very good. All right. So, and then you, you sold it and uh, what happened next for you? Kind of walk me through. Is that when you started doing Pegasus or what, what did you do next? Well, we, yeah, we sold it to a company called Verisk Analytics. And okay. there the, the seemed to be a, a lot of opportunity inside this company that okay. is just, you know, a, a remarkable story in it in itself, having started as a nonprofit association uh, built by insurance companies and having become a for-profit company uh, at the time that I joined it, along with 40 plus other acquisitions that they made. And the desire was to continue to make it, make acquisitions that were connected somehow to the insurance industry. And okay. uh, that was um, that was what I was tasked with doing. And one of the areas that we became very interested in was was retail and supply chain. And we just kept coming back to the idea that supply chain risk was something that wouldn't go away. It would get worse and would would become a, a very important part of uh, data and analytics. Okay. And when you say supply chain risk, do you mean like supply disappearing as it's in transport, getting stolen from stolen from the warehouse, getting damaged, or all the above? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, all the above. But our starting point, because of what we'd been doing up to that point, was discussions with insurance companies about okay. cargo being stolen and okay. what else happens to uh, to cargos and transportation units in transit. But that, okay. you know, we, we wanted to expand beyond that eventually. I'm having that. I'm, I'm, I'm visualizing that scene in, in Goodfellas where uh, Joe Pesci and Ray Liotta are, are stealing that truck that's about to deliver to uh, the airport there in New York. I'm having that, yeah, that yeah. scene where they just the driver gets right. out and he goes in the coffee shop and they take the truck. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly, uh, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Oh, so you you stayed with with Verisk for a while then, but uh, what happened? You decided, hey, I'm ready to start something else, or walk me through the transition there into EverStream. Yeah, I think like like. Almost everything that I've done, there sort of came a point where both both I and those around me felt as if things had sort of got as far as they could get in that environment, and it was okay. time to to kind of try the same thing or something slightly different uh, in a, in a different environment. And it was really what we had done at, at Verisk was to try and come up with a plan to bring together a number of companies that had already made progress around broader supply chain risk management analytics. Uh, we actually ended up acquiring a company called Wood McKenzie for $3 billion and went wow. down a completely different path in and around oil and gas upstream data. So it was it was a good time. I've been there for seven years. It was a good time for me to go out and sort of ask the question with venture capital companies, you know, is, is this worth pursuing? You know, is there a, 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 an opportunity to build a platform that helps companies manage risk in, in their supply chain. And so that's, that, that, that's what led to, to Everstream analytics. Okay. So you went out and raised cash or partnered with people right away. And, and did you bootstrap it yourself as well? A little bit of both you put in cash, you raised some cash to get it going. Do you mind sharing some details for Everstream? Sure. Yeah. Well, it was a little different. To that because I, I was going down those traditional paths of talking to venture capital companies about these various different startups that had, as I say, made some progress. Mm. But a VC company generally wants to sort of spread bets across a number of different portfolio companies mm -hmm. and for private equity companies that might be more in inclined to do roll-ups. 
it was really just too small. Um, but I, I came across an, an, an amazing uh, group of investors out of Washington, D.C. called Columbia Capital. And if the, if the idea is big enough, if the theme is big enough and it fits with one of their areas of expertise, they say, let's be stage agnostic. Let, let's invest early and let's continue to lead the rounds and, uh, and, and, and see this all the way through. Mm -hmm. And they've been thinking about supply chain opportunities. And so we came together and for a year really took a hard look at the, the companies that were in the marketplace, um, the, the potential demand for this type of data and analytics, um, and the idea that we could really change the landscape by taking the traditional approach to supply chain risk management, which is kind of done in a silo, and integrating that into the actual process of, of supply chain management so that so that risk would be embedded in all supply chain decisions. And with their help, we were able to make two acquisitions, integrate them, and form what has now become Everstream Analytics. I see. And you had did you have a co-founder in the beginning and or co-founders? And, yeah. and who, who well, are they? It was. It, this is this is how Columbia Capital is is, is so helpful. I, I said, you know, I'd love to work with you on this, but you know, I, I I would I really need to have a top class CFO, COO, and operational team. And they mm -hmm. said, well, we we know a ton of those people. Uh, we'll bring them in at the right time. Let's let's start with uh, you know this person that we've worked with before. Okay. Um, who who we've we've had success with, bought uh, bought him in as a, as a consultant. Um, his name's Chris Arroyo, and after the first pint, we agreed we were going to be business partners and do this together, and <laughs> and we That's did. Great. It, it was uh, it was it was great. That's good. Okay, I'm gonna if you don't, and some of this you may not want to answer for privacy, but I know the listeners are always curious for our show. Uh, how did you get the meeting with Columbia? D did you know somebody was, were they in your network? Did you, did you call, did you cold call? Hey, Hey, my name's David. I want to start a company. Can you fund me? Or how'd you get that meeting? <laughs> I, I, I guess it was, you know, sometimes, uh, you just got to be lucky. And, um, uh, <laughs> some, someone called me up. I never, never met him before. Um, he said, you know, I've been working with this company and, he got my number from someone else who I'd worked with in the past and, and said, yeah, you know, David knows a bit about data and analytics. So give him a call. And that that's how the initial connection happened with Columbia Capital. I'd, I'd never heard of them. And, you know, frankly, I don't know if they'll, you know, lo love what we're talking about here because they love to fly under the radar. They've got, <laughs> they got a great idea. They want to keep it to themselves. So, um, uh... It was, it was, it, it was really just luck. Wow. Okay. Message to the Columbia executives, whatever recruiting firm you've been using, you need to stop using them and call me at RiderFlex and we'll have a discussion. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, real quick. Um, did you have to, this is another question I get from aspiring entrepreneurs all the time on the show. It's one of their number one uh, topics, you know, how, how soon to give up control, how much equity you give away based on how much cash they raise, blah, blah, blah. Right. Me and you could probably do a whole episode on that topic. Uh, was this a situation where right from the beginning, because you didn't put in a ton of personal cash, they were quote in control of the cap table right from the beginning? Yeah, very, yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, okay. And okay. The, the the beauty of having a, you know Chris as a business partner is he was able to talk me through Columbia's process and what okay. he'd done with them before, and the way that they look after the entrepreneurs, the operators, mm. in, in, a, in a way that causes those teams, just like Chris and that I'm doing now, to want to work with them again in, in, in the future. It's, uh, right. it, it's, it's sort of, it sounds obvious when you say it, but not, not, not a lot of investors truly operate that way. So it, it was very different from the traditional entrepreneurs route, didn't really have those types of decisions to make. But Having having investors that you can trust is is critical, but how, you know how do you know on day one? It's, it's right. That's a tough yeah, one. that's a tough one, and I've heard so many nightmare stories. Right, I've had so many people on the show go, you know, that have said, "Oh my God, I wish I'd never taken that cash." You know, but of course, if they hadn't taken it, maybe they wouldn't be where they're at. So you know, 
But, yeah. uh, uh, you know, great point, though, what you said about uh, their investment in people and the desire to to understand, like, hey, if I take care of this person, if we do a good job here, then when we get ready to start something else, I can call David or Chris again and we can go do another one. I mean, that is super yeah. critical. And you're right. So many investors, they look for that short term, quick payout deal, and then they burn people along the way. They burn people at stake along the way, right? And uh, boy, if you can keep those relationships, yeah, then it's somebody you can go to later. Great point. I appreciate you uh, bringing that up. Yeah, and it's not. It, it's easy to say, and it's obvious, but it's it's not. It's not easy to do. And like, like almost any organization, what 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 is what is driving them and the structure that they have makes it harder or easier to act like that. And because Columbia is stage agnostic, and they're kind of going on the entire journey with the entrepreneurs, whether whether there's you know one, two, three, four CEOs, they're on the they're on the whole journey. And yeah. um, I think that uh, I. I that's either the investment thesis because of the kind of people they are, or they're more easily able to be that, that kind of person because of the, the structure that they have. And I, I mean, probably not by coincidence, but the first time I, I really met them, I was at a, a social event. I met a, a bunch of CEOs and ex-CEOs of their portfolio companies, and a, a number of them were on their third go-around with Columbia. And to uh, me, that says everything. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, that was a great sign. Any advice to uh, <clears throat> entrepreneurs that are getting ready to raise cash or ask a billionaire to write a check? A anything you want to tell them real quick? Any? Yeah, I know that's another probably 30 minute answer. Well, but... <laughs> I, I, I guess I'd say two things. One is, you know, just, you know, be, be, be eyes wide open and realistic. People are giving you money because they want to make more money. <laughs> it's not because they want to save the world or maybe they do, but, you know, they're giving you the, the money side of it is because they want to make they want to make money and you know you have you know fiduciary right to your investors to to to, to create a, a return i think the um what's what's sort of beneath that is the more nuanced but important dynamics of kind of their their values and and how they treat people it's not that you know you expect them to roll over and but it's 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 how they do the difficult things that matters most. And talking to other entrepreneurs who've worked with them in the past is certainly you know one thing that I, I would I would recommend. Um, but but you know have the tough discussions as early as you can in in in, in any cycle because you'll 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 know um, you'll, you'll pretty quickly know the kind of people you're working with. Great point about saving the world versus making money and really trying to do both at the same time. So th this is a message, especially for the younger people, right? As I'll pick on the millennials for a minute and even Gen Z, you know, <clears throat> it's great if you want to save the world and make the planet a better place. That That's awesome. But the way the world currently works, you can only do that if you're making money along the way. Like you can't, you can't, you can't save the world by money just falling out of the sky. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, we, you know, people talk, talk about sustainable businesses. And I think that you should think about sustainability, not just in terms of the environment, but also right. in terms of economic sustainability and operational sustainability. And that's, that's, the, that, that's the business of the future. And so to be able to combine the right values and beliefs with the right business model and to understand where the trade-offs are, and also to appreciate that you're more likely to have a good business in 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 years if you have a workforce that feels as if they're being treated well and that they're doing something that has purpose and meaning. And it, it, it doesn't have to be inventing the next hydrogen car. It, it can be selling insurance or selling fish, but the way you do it, how you do it, and how you interact with your clients is what infuses it with pur purpose and, 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 and meaning. And I think people, again, back to my earlier point, people kind of miss that a little bit. They want to they want to be sort of, if the website doesn't say we're saving the world, they'll go somewhere else. Well, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a million ways to make the world a better place. Great point. Yes, you've 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 struck a chord with me on this one because I'm super passionate about this topic lately. You know, yeah, the 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 great culture and the mission statement and uh, you know planting trees in the forest and oh my god, this is such a great company and look at all these wonderful things we do. That's all cool. That's wonderful. 
You don't do it unless whatever service or product you're providing is making money and the business model is sound and you got to do both. Yeah. Great point. Right. Uh, well, and, and how you, and how you treat people, how, how you treat an individual at work has an impact on yes. how they treat their friends and family at home and in their community and, mm -hmm. and businesses that treat people well, uh, directly an impact uh, directly and indirectly a positive impact on, you know, on their, their families and societies. And it's sort of, you know, that's, Again, sounds obvious, but most companies don't think of it that way. You're right. Here's a good question that I think uh, listeners want to know about. I do get this sometimes. You're the founder, the CEO. You take some money. You, you get it going. The company grows. Maybe it makes an acquisition. Maybe some more rounds come in. At some point, the original founder either wants to step down or needs to step down, either either wants to or has a desire to, or maybe the investors are like, hey, cool, great job, Johnny, you got it going. Now we're going to bring in somebody that's run a billion dollar company before, you know, can you please step over, yep. step aside, et cetera. Did that kind of, how, how did that happen for you as it progressed with Columbia and Everstream? Because I can tell by looking at your LinkedIn, there were some changes there. So if you don't mind me share, if, sharing the progression. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the sort of the origin story was, as I said, you know, me and others kind of coming around to help Columbia make these, uh, these acquisitions. Yeah. And, you know, there was, you know, what one path forward would have been with, a, a, one of the CEOs of an acquired company ending up running the combined companies. Mm. That didn't that didn't end up being the case. So I ended up leading or partnering with Chris to lead the integration of the companies. And okay. you know, to to sort of build on your point, it, we're all, we're all different. We all have different strengths and, and weaknesses, and it and it takes a different type of person with different strengths to take a company from zero dollars to a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And it's different getting it to ten million dollars, and then it's di different getting it to to fifty million in you know annual recurring revenue or whatever whatever those steps happen to be. And that you know whatever those steps are, are different. It's different for different people. It's different for different businesses. And one of the things that I think Columbia is is very thoughtful about is is, is that and who who are the right people, right mm -hmm. places, you know, right seats on the bus at, at the right time in the business. And we, we had done the integration. We built the business. Business was growing well. What we really needed was somebody with more of a go-to-market expertise. And my strength was finding the businesses and you know bringing them in and helping connect them and building a strategy around that. Mm. And so I stepped into the chief strategy officer role so that I could be thinking about what comes next. Okay. And Julie came in with a you know, very much a sort of go to market. How do we, now we built it, how do we grow it? And bringing for her to be, be able to bring people in that were really, you know, a, a class from a go to market standpoint. Uh, we had, you know, really strong team in terms of data science and things like that. Um, and it's been fantastic. Uh, it, you know, and, and, and the way that Columbia manages that, um, I, I think the biggest thing I would say about that, and this is for not just not just for founders, but anyone who's coming in or out of a business, is is sort of you know two ways of thinking about it. You could call it the sort of boomerang effect, but to me, it's really about ego of yes. the individual and an ego within or an understanding of that within the sort of investors and board. Um, I you know. To, to me, a title, it's not the title. It's what are you doing? How are you adding value? Do you feel as if there's purpose? Are you building the right relationships with those around you? Title doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so we just had a great time bringing Julie into the business, her getting the business, uh, getting her feet under her, getting the business growing. Uh, it, is, it is really growing very, very well now. And I've been able to step back. And guess what? I'm now back with Columbia. Uh, asking them, or maybe they're asking me, yeah, what do we do next? Yep. I mean, to, to say there are uh, a number of opportunities in and around supply chain would be a, an enormous understatement. Um, and uh, it, it, it's great to be spending my time with them working out, well, what does that look like? What, what, what would be the next investment in and around supply chain technology? Isn't it? Aren't you fascinated by the amount of 
or what the what percentage of founders have giant egos and they just can't they just can't get out of their own way. They just they they I see it all the time. You know, they started the business, and they had an idea, or maybe they had created something or made something, and they get it going, and they and it's it's time for them to step aside or move away or whatever, and they just can't. They just they can't do it. Their ego will not allow them to do it. Or if that's not the case, I see where they try to do it. They say they want to do it. And then they invest time and they bring in a CEO. And then all they do is make it messy for the new CEO and get in the way. And, you know, and, and then they fire the CEO and then they take back over. I see it all the time. <laughs> yep. yep. Happen, happens all the time. Um, and and I yep. think it's, you know, again, it's, you know, it's a separate podcast, but um, <laughs> yes. You know, when you when you start sort of peeling the onion back and asking, well, why? Um, if 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 it if it ultimately ends up destroying some level of enterprise value for everyone, including mm. the founder, mm. it, it would it would seem to be illogical, and 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 therefore it, it it's likely to be emotional. It's you know it's it's driven by, yep. you know, we we pretty much have the same brains we had when we were you know chasing uh, saber tooth tiger or being chased by. Saber tooth tigers, and and sometimes you know that kind of you know the monkey brain uh, takes over, um, you know, for a minute or for an hour or for a year, and we we genuinely can't get out of our own ways. So I I, I think that um, in the same way that you know when you get an NF you get drafted into the NFL, your first meeting should be with a financial advisor. I, I think more more CEOs and boards would would benefit from having coaches and therapists to, to really help people kind of dig into the things that get in the way to call it ego is an oversimplification, but you know, that, that's where it's coming from. Uh, just for all the listeners, I'll just tell you right now, uh, Ryder flex, uh, I have gotten it to, Oh, we'll probably do $3 million this year. And I'm fully ready for somebody to come in and take it to $20 million and I'm happy to move out of the way. Just give me a call. <laughs> I don't, I have, I, you know, and I've said that to so many people, you know, like on a serious note and here's a good example for the listeners. So, so I was an operations guy, right? I was an ops executive. I never really was a strategy visionary. I didn't, I never really saw myself that way. And that was not my strength, but I could execute pretty well. And, and I was an ops guy, right. And a team builder. And here's an example of us just getting it to maybe 3 million, just out of tenacity, uh, just out of hard work and execution, not real vision, so to speak, right. Or, or, or strategy. And that myself is a perfect example of, of a company where a CEO needs to say, okay, I need to bring somebody in that complements my skill set that can get this thing to the next level. And uh, anyway, so many people just don't do it. So I commend you and applaud you for being very comfortable with that and not, you know, because you could have easily like made it messy for Columbia or whatever, or burned bridges. You know, you could have easily done all that, but instead you're like, hey, yes, no problem. <laughs> and I'm I'm over here. And what else do you need me? Let's do something else together. I love that. I love that. Really, well, it's uh, yeah. I mean, th thank you, but um, it, it's as a result of you know having been through it a few times before, um, and you know learn learn the hard lessons. Um, but but primarily, I think it's it, it's down to the way that Columbia treats people, That's and awesome. a a desire to work with them in the future, and you know them just you know making it uh, easy and for, for people to feel you know comfortable and trusted. Everstream Analytics, it's everstream.ai. You want to give a three, like a two, three minute, you want to give a little elevator pitch really quick? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, Everstream Analytics helps companies see and act on risk in their supply chains. Um, and that goes from raw material all the way through to, to final delivery and arguably beyond. And, and Everstream does that by essentially creating a digital twin of a company's supply chain. So okay. what? Wh who are my suppliers? Where are they? Where are their facilities? Where do they get their inputs from and to tier three and tier four and all the way through to raw material, the logistics networks that, that connect them, my factories, my distribution networks that connect me to my clients and where their clients are 
And to overlay that and integrate that with real-time event data, what is happening in the world today that has or might disrupt my or my partner's supply chain, and then to be able to turn that into predictive risk mm. scoring, what do we think is going to happen? How severe? What's the likelihood? And by combining all of that, ultimately, to be able to give companies risk insights that can be embedded, embedded into the decision-making pro processes that might be strategic or tactical, might be for transportation, warehousing, supplier uh, management, supplier selection. Our core belief is that these risk insights, be they real-time or predictive, have got to be embedded into the platforms and processes that companies use to make supply chain decisions Mm. so that they can risk adjust every decision. Every decision should have risk taken into account. And it, it may be that you say, I'll, I'll take the risk, but take right. risk into account. How much risk <laughs> do you want? Because everything's a trade-off. And I guess you have, I'm sure you have a tons of case studies that show, hey, if you invest in the cost of EverStream, your loss prevention, your insurance, your theft, all, all these numbers reduce far enough and a way to cover anything on the cost of Everstream and more, I'm assuming. Yeah, the cost of Everstream is is really a, a rounding error compared to the cost yeah. of <laughs> the things that you need to do to become more resilient. Right. And that might be changing the design of your network. It might be having redundancy in suppliers or an in inventory. Mm. That costs a lot of money. And to be spending that money in the right place at the right time is an enormous upside. You know, Everstream annual subscription is, is tiny compared to the kind of numbers in terms of both what you're spending money on as a, as a corporation and the upside of knowing that because of a cyber attack on an aluminum smelter, prices are going to go up. So mm -hmm. knowing that, not just as soon as you can, but knowing it before others know it, that's there's this huge upside to, to, to things like that. And as you say, there are hundreds of use cases because we're thinking about this truly end to end. Would you, is it oversimplification to say a supply chain SaaS company? Is that oversimplified in description? Well, I, I, I think it is. I mean, the, the question is, is it is it a useful description? And it, it's probably an oversimplification because by that definition, there are many thousands of companies that are the same. So okay. I think that to, to add the idea of risk analytics and predictive analytics is important okay. because it, okay. then, it then helps to narrow it down pretty quickly. I got you. Very good. Um, thank you for sharing that. Before We're almost out of time, uh, David. And uh, I want to ask you before we hang up, because you're a military guy and you're a risk guy and you've seen theft and risk and cyber attacks, whatever. Got to ask you, how are you feeling right now? And I know this is an hour long podcast, but I just got to get this. How are you feeling right now about... Uh, um, the state of affairs with 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 China and Russia and are you like as a as an old military guy like are you a little nervous right now do you think ah everything's fine how are you feeling I'm just curious how you're feeling so everything is not fine okay um, what is happening in Ukraine and what is happening with Russia is pretty well known pretty well analyzed mm. um, and could go in a in a couple of different directions, all, all those scenarios have been planned out pretty well. And the impact that is, has been felt in terms of the, the commercial side of this has been felt. And, mm -hmm. you know, Europe's had to respond in terms of energy security and things like that. So um, it, it, it's terrible what's happening in Ukraine. But I think in terms of thinking about the next year or two and what might happen, um, I think we've got a reasonable line of sight to the potential scenarios <clears throat> in and around Ukraine. I think China's very different in as much as um, there's obviously trade wars going on mm. um, and a lot of that is being driven by national security in a kind of in, in an economic wrapper. 
human rights wrapper, um, everything else. But what China is prepared to do as they see their population aging, they see their GDP slowing down, Taiwan dynamics changing, what Russia, what, what China does with, with respect to Taiwan and what that might lead to makes me very nervous. If I, mm. if I was a company and I had any level of significant investment uh, in China, which is most companies, directly or indirectly, I'd, I'd, be, very, I'd be very nervous about uh, what might happen. And it's always likelihood time severity. And there's no doubt the severity is, is, is immense. Um, mm -hmm. And the likelihood, even if it isn't full-blown war, of something happening, of things getting worse or much worse is quite high. I agree. And not to scare the listeners, uh, but I agree. And I, you know, it's almost like nuclear weapons don't even apply, right? Like, I mean, it, that's almost off the table, right? Because because I don't, I just don't see anybody using those on any side, which means it could, it, it, it goes down to all these other things that could happen, like, like what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. And, um, you know, there's a hell of a lot more people in China than there is here. <laughs> you know, yep. so, yeah, it makes me a little nervous too, my friend. Uh, yeah. I'm not in, yeah. No, I I'm think, not... uh, yeah, I think uh, AI and, cloud computing and everything that powers it particularly chips that's uh that's the new battlefront no no doubt and uh with just like two minutes left yeah i'll just uh i just had this long conversation and i've had several ai robotics uh technology people on the podcast um i just saw another article today uh where another guy was calling for a pause on ai and you know people I think some people are, are making fun of folks who are like, oh, Skynet and Terminator and blah, blah, blah. And people are like, ha, 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 that's kind of a joke. Well, I don't know. I think we're moving from movie joke stage, joke stage to like, no, actually, it's kind of serious. And actually, it could be real. And we better pay attention because <laughs> if, you know, right. you know, it's 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 past the uh, making fun of the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and joking around about it. like, no, actually, we're kind of almost here. We better be careful because that could do all kinds of other things. And uh, but I'll, I'm going to have you back on the show. To talk about that topic. <laughs> I look forward to it. It's, uh, it's a fascinating topic. It is, man. It is. You know, the good news is I'm old enough to where when robots take over, finally, I'm already going to be dead. But uh, <laughs> my my granddaughters, I'm worried about my granddaughters, right? A little bit. I'm a little nervous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they're going to have a lot to deal with. No doubt. They're going to they're gonna have a lot to deal with. David, thank you so much for being on the Rider Flex podcast and sharing your story. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Enjoyed chatting. Thanks for the time.